Um, well, without much ado, I think the introduction has been done. I think the key thing uh, just uh, is the fact that I'm an angel investor. Um, and what I want to cover with you today, we'll just go through some high level definitions. I'll take a look at the ideal founder and why he needs to start with a vision, especially now, given the uncertainty that's being created. We'll talk about startups for real and what makes them different in terms of growth, in terms of funding, and of course, my favorite part, of course, exits. Um, we'll talk about very, very briefly the startup investment portfolio theory by my mentor, David Rose, and hopefully we'll then get to look at the different investment stages and what we're expecting from each of you as startups as you go along that journey as investor. I'll share my startup uh, scorecard with you so you know how we measure these things. And if time permits, maybe even take a quick look at a case study. But really, to start with, uh, some definitions. What's an angel investor? Because that's what I claim I am. Well, it's really somebody who invests personal capital, okay, including time, mentoring, and advising, connecting and funding startups in addition to cash. Um, and you've of course got the innovation hubs and accelerators. Well, they're a fun place to be. And, and that's really where startups grow to, go to grow up. And VCs, well, they're the guys with the big money and help make everything happen uh, one step at a time. So I hope you're getting an idea of where I'm coming from uh, today. So the ideal founder, what does that person look like? Well, first is they've got to be a visionary capable of succeeding and bringing their vision to life. That's the first thing I'm looking for. I'm looking for passion, you know, somebody who can actually drive and, you know, give momentum to a team, but also somebody who can manage it. And most importantly, somebody who's an executive who understands the importance of attracting expertise, not just you know, self done it. The single most important thing though, in my opinion, is somebody who's self-aware. The best entrepreneurs, the best founders I've met, and I've met a few in my time, you know, are totally self-aware. They know exactly where they're going and they've got great ideas on how to get there. So that means as you look ahead, we've got COVID, we've got restrictions, um, we're staring 2023, 25, you know, in the face, you're looking, what's even 2030 looking like? Well, first thing is, it's got to start with a vision. To start and sustain a successful startup, okay, you need to have a compelling vision that's going to drive execution of the activities you're doing, okay? The life of that bench is measured, actually, by the progress you make towards that, the realization of that vision. It's that, that journey, that successful delivery of that vision by the startup. That's what the innovation hubs, that's what the angel investors and everybody, that's what we're rah, rah, rounding to join around to help make along. And because, you know, we're focused, um, just like you should be, um, primarily in making sure that the commercial potential of the venture, okay, uh, is realized then therefore there are two things we've got to focus on. The first is the product service offering, you know, which is the promise you are making to the market in terms of this is how I'm going to solve the problem or this is what I'm going to do as a product or as a, as a service. Um, that's the first thing. And the second, of course, is how it's delivered because it's good to make a promise. And, you know, yeah, that's what brings the cash. But if you're short on delivery, it's not going to work. So that's where sustainability is built in is into delivery. That brings to the question startups, because I keep talking, I talk about startups, others talk about SMEs, other businesses, or oh, is it a startup just something that starts yesterday? Well, let me correct that notion. Okay, uh, I want to talk about startups. The startups are actually built for rapid growth in extreme uncertainty. Okay, it's an entrepreneurial venture in its early stages. And the critical thing is, it's aimed at bringing to market an innovative product, okay, or service. It's that innovation that nobody's done this this way before. 
That's the first thing that makes a startup different. That's why it's not a hotel. It can be an Airbnb, which changes the paradigm of hotels. That's why it's not a car hire service. It could be an Uber that changes the paradigm of car hire services. But it's the innovation that makes a startup in the first instance. Well, there are other things that also make a startup. Startups are different to traditional uh, new small businesses in three fundamental ways, which I want to share with you today. Okay. The first is around growth. The second is on funding. And the third is on exits. When we talk about startup growth, okay, in comparison to traditional business ventures, startups in Africa, by my reckoning, I expect to see 10 to 20 percent month on month growth, okay, in their growth stage. So they are going, and I'm talking top line revenue and customer acquisition. That's the first big difference. You don't expect that of an SME. That is insane growth. That's the first difference in how you know a startup. The second, of course, is the fact that there are people like myself and the VCs who invest in startups. So their source of funding is totally different. It's high-risk funding. And for that, it's a totally different metaphor. So that's the second differentiation, is the startups do attract funding. The third and final is the fact that because they do attract funding, Right from the very time they get their funding, the investors are asking about exits. If I give you more money, how do I come out? And we are starting to see those exits pop in. Um, the quiet one, which was a nice one for me, for most of you that know me know about my investment in Super Strikers. Strikers is now a Disney India property. And of course, I mean, who? in our ecosystem didn't hear about the $200 million acquisition of Paystack by Stripe. Well, actually some of my own angel investors in, in my syndicate, they did a few X out of that. Anyway, let me move on and talk about the startup investment portfolio by my mentor, David S. Rose. David says there are five startup truths. The first is that most startups will fail. The second, no one actually knows which startup is not going to fail. And because of those first two, investing in startups is a numbers game. And he says, you know what? What ends up, and that's where we expect to see startups go, is that valuation going north? Usually went down first. That means, you know what I mean about burn rates. And finally, from an investor standpoint, all startups always need more money. Now that I've clarified that, I'm just going to very, very quickly share with you the fact that we've got a whole range of investors on the startup journey, right from research grants to personal savings from um, family and friends all the way through to um, grants in, the, in their own right, angel investors, incubators, and accelerators. The critical thing is for startups to get out of what we call the startup value of death, where eh, they're just about starting to get customers but don't get enough. That's where most startups fail. And that is why we have angel investors take a look at them just about when they're starting to struggle with that. And so when you look at startup investment focuses, there aren't any set formulas actually to do this. But generally, there are five stages pre-seed when we're betting typically on the founding team. Seed stage, well, that bets on the product service offering. And by the time you're getting to growth, well, we see traction and there are other measures for subsequent stages. So the first question I want to ask you as you sit there listening to me is, what stage are you? Are you still an idea or do you have customers? Are you growing? Are you scaling? Why? Because that's what investors want to know at the very first instance. And that's where my framework, the POEM framework comes in. Well, POEM breaks it down very, very simply and says, you know, what's your proposition? And at idea stage, I expect to see a defined concept. 
by the time you're a startup, the established offer should be in place. At growth, you're looking at increasing market share. By the time you're scaling, you're looking at new markets and new products, and it goes on like that. In terms of the organization itself, the question becomes, at ideation, do you have a business model? When you're a startup, we expect to see a delivery structure for operations. At growth, traction is what I'm expecting. And again, there are expectations as you go through each of the stages to get to market leadership. Similarly, with the money and the finance and the economics, from ideation, the expectation is at least you've seen some friends and family, maybe even some grant money thrown in to help you get started. By the time you're coming to us um, as angel investors, you've met the other criteria uh, for stage one. At growth, you're looking at break even. And of course, at scale, it's about unit profitability all the way through to when the exit comes. In terms of milestones, as I said earlier, seed stage, well, my expectation of you at seed stage is you've got a minimum viable product, something that is actually in the hands of customers, making you some money, yeah, what's and all, but at least it's got you going. Once you've done that, the next thing is actually to find product market fit. And profit market fit is based, you will know when you get product market fit because your customer acquisition will go gangbusters. It's just that simple. And as for growth, well, we're talking of sustainable growth management. That's what we're looking for here. And finally, at scale, well, new markets and products, and it goes on to the more significant. When it comes to our assessments, we do a, a, a critical analysis based on a structured approach that I've just shared with you. And we issue a scorecard that looks at your proposition and gives you markings for each of the areas that you do have. Same thing for the organization, looking at the vision of the entrepreneur all the way through to access to resources, and that again is scored. Um, on the economic side, similarly, it's a question of, are you all the way there with all the kind of things expected to be seen? And then there's a score. And finally, for my stones, well, can I get out of this? And all the like. Now, by the time you've done this, this is a, I thought, a, I'd share a case study of what it then looks like of something that gets uh, invested in. So uh, it's been a whistle stop tour because I wanted to keep it short and sharp. I'd like to thank you very, very much for listening. My name is Tommy Davis. Your feedback's important.